of the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus, because you're worthy, God. You're an awesome Savior, Lord, God. We will bless your name, Jesus. We will bless your name, God. Hallelujah, God. Glory, 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 God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to your name, God. You're worthy, God. Thank you, God. Lord God, I can bless your name, 
Jesus because you're good Lord God I can give you glory God because you're good God hallelujah Jesus thank you Lord God there's nobody like my Savior there's nobody greater than him hallelujah Jesus I can cry out hallelujah to the King of Kings to the Lord of Lords yes God
the Lord the spirit of the Lord is here right now he's like a consuming fire he burns inside uh, burn Lord burn all the weight of sin uh, in my life Jesus and allow the spirit to be conceived right now inside of us uh, a burning fire a hunger a thirst a reaching out for you Jesus I want more of your presence I want more of your love inside of me in the name of Jesus Hallelujah. Jesus I love and adore you Jesus I worship you with all my heart oh consume me Lord more of you more of your presence If you have a need in your 
your life, I want you to present that to the Lord right now because the Spirit of the Lord is right here to minister to that need. In the name of Jesus, I'm claiming victory over Brother Ross. In Jesus' name, I pray the consuming fire to flow over his body and light him up, Lord, with your power. Light him up with your anointing. In the name of Jesus, let a miracle be conceived. There's a miracle happening in your life when your response to Jesus. Oh, how I love you, Lord. Worship him, worship him. His for you, you to be glorified, you to be. presence of God we don't practice this mu that much just close your eyes right now everybody close your eyes just feel the presence of God listen to the voice of God let him speak to you
Spirit of God is therapeutic to your mind. It's therapeutic to your body. It's therapeutic to your soul. It's okay to just be silent and listen. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give a hand clap to the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's give a hand clap to the Lord. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love and adore you with all my heart. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. It's okay, church, to worship God. And in silence, just feel the presence of God. You might not understand it, but God will speak to you and he'll put a thought and he'll put comfort. And you'll put you in a place of stillness, stillness and tranquility. In the midst of all the pressure that you go through, he puts you in stillness. And when you can just, in silence, worship him, love him. Oh, the spirit of the Lord comes in a beautiful way into you. And he ministers to you amen i'd like for each and every one of us to uh greet one another and and just welcome each other with the love of god amen Amen. Let us take our seats this evening. How many of you are grateful to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Praise God. I like what I feel. We're going to ask the ushers to prepare and come if I can get some gentlemen to help us here, please. Also, want to keep the church in mind that uh, this Sunday morning, we will be having our last Sunday morning service for 2017. Hard to believe. Wow, this year is wrapped up and now we are moving on. So please join us. Also, this is your last chance to make any contributions for uh, tax purposes. Uh, please have them dated and turned in by Sunday. Uh, Sunday morning, 10 a.m. service. Amen. Please come and we're going to have a wonderful time in the Lord. We will be having watch night service also on Sunday. So please come back and join us 10 p.m. We will be having communion. Amen. And we're going to cleanse ourselves and we're going to be right. Amen. And we always uh, usher in the new year in the house of the Lord because I believe that God is going to give us a vision. Amen. Pastor has been praying and I believe that God is going to speak to us in that service next Sunday. So please make it every intention for yourself to be here. Praise the Lord. Let us stand tonight. We're going to pray over our tithe and our offering, and then you can come and give. Amen. Father, we thank you, Jesus, for your sweet presence and your touch that is here tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to unfold your will in our lives, God. We give unto you tonight, Lord Jesus, from the joy of our hearts, Lord, because every gift cometh from you, Lord. And I pray tonight, Lord, that as we honor your word, Lord Jesus, that you would pour out blessings upon your people, O oh God, in the mighty name of Jesus, and let everybody say amen. 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 As they sing, would you march and come and give tonight? You are a mighty God.
voice, let every voice worship him and magnify him. Hallelujah, Jesus, there is none beside thee, O God. None before thee, Lord, you are first and you are the last, Lord, the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end, Jesus. We love you this morning, this evening, God. We lift you up, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes. I like that. Hallelujah. My God's bigger than my problem. Hallelujah. God is bigger than any struggle that I might fight in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's nothing. There's nothing that my God cannot do. Hallelujah. How many of you are a witness to that tonight? Hallelujah. He's been there for you. Come on. I said he's been there for you. Right when the time was right, he came through. Hallelujah. He spoke and the sea was calm. Hallelujah. 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 Let us magnify him and rejoice one more time. Hallelujah. Father, you are great, O oh one and holy one, matchless Lord God. We love you this evening, God. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Mighty, mighty, mighty. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us stand this evening. We're going to invite our speaker to come at this time. Would you put your hands together and welcome Sister Angela. She comes to minister the word of the Lord to you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's raise our hands in the presence of God. Lord, you are worthy. You are awesome. Thank you for visiting us tonight with your presence, with your power, with your anointing. Lord, that in your presence we can truly accomplish anything. In your presence, oh God, we can become strong when we were weak. Lord, we can become joyful when we were despondent. We can become powerful, oh God. Lord, in your presence, and Lord, I pray that you would use me as your voice tonight to speak. Speak to us tonight, oh God. Hallelujah, you are worthy. You are worthy in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. The presence of God is wonderful. I love feeling the presence of God, amen. I love being in the presence of God, and it reminds me when I wasn't living for God and how blessed we are tonight to feel what we feel, how blessed we are to know God, how blessed we are to be able to raise our hands and say thank you. Thank you for dying on a cross for me, God. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for coming for me, oh God. Thank you for picking me up out of the mess that I was in. Thank you for putting me a ministry in my life. Thank you for calling me to greatness. Thank you, God, for your blood. Hallelujah. I'm thankful tonight. I'm thankful. Tonight, the title of my message is A Heavenly Heartbeat. And when I think about just the intricacies of our body, it's just, it's amazing when you think about, we don't have to, we don't have to think about breathing. We don't tell our heart to beat. We don't tell our heart to beat blood through our veins. And when I think about the human heart, I was just researching a little bit. It begins to beat the first month of conception. And from that moment, it starts beating until the moment it stops. The human heart, it works tirelessly to give us life. When the human heart stops beating, the body cannot survive. The average heart, it beats 72 times per minute, approximately 100,000 times in the course of a day. In one year, it beats approximately 38 million times and by the time we turn 70 years old, it has beaten 2.5 billion times. All of this is done without having to think about it. But God has put that in us to automatically send that most vital liquid for survival. Blood is the fluid of life because it transports nutrients, oxygen, and heat throughout our body. 
Red blood cells can deliver oxygen through the body into ports waste, and white blood cells fights off infection and disease. It's incredible. There are approximately 15,000 white blood cells and hundreds of millions of red blood cells in a single drop of blood. It's incredible when we think about the majesty of our God. It's incredible when we think that he spoke this world into existence and he took us from the dust of the earth and formed us, but not just the form of us, but the intricate parts of us. When David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, who can really understand that there are millions, hundreds of millions of red blood cells in a single drop of blood and that that blood deports waste from our body. It brings oxygen to our body. It, it, it helps uh, fight off infections for our body. In just a single drop of blood. An average heart pumps 2.4 ounces of blood per heartbeat. Almost 7 million gallons per year. And the, by the ripe age of 70 years old, our hearts have pumped about 48 million gallons of blood through our heart. Our heart was built for a purpose. Our heart was built for life. And our heart was built for love. And when I prayed for tonight's service, I thought about the heart, the vibrant heart of God beating on that cross for all of humanity. And then the flow of his blood streaming down from Calvary that we can experience his forgiveness, his mercy, his love, his redemption, which we have felt in this place tonight. What we have felt was his power. What we have felt is his presence. What we have felt is that amazing redemption that he has given us that when he gave up the ghost on calvary that that veil that that separated people it was torn in half and his presence was not only held in the holiest of holies but then it went throughout the whole earth in luke chapter 29 verse 19 and 20 if you have your bibles with you luke chapter 22 verse 19 and 20 It says, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do ye in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Let's just pray once again. Lord, thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you that your heart is beating for us tonight. Your heart is beating for our family members. Your heart is beating for the billions of people in this world, oh God. It is calling out to people in this world tonight, God. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us to hear your heartbeat. That you would allow us to feel your heart beating inside of our chest tonight. And that we would think about souls Lord, without even telling ourselves to do that, it would just become second nature to look at somebody and to see that if we do not reach them, that they will go to hell. If we don't tell them about your love, oh God, that they may never make it to eternity. Lord, help us tonight for your presence and your leading and your guiding. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. 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 We don't have a spiritual life within us unless we have the heartbeat of God beating in our chest and his blood flowing through our veins. We need to feel the urgency of his spirit calling to this world for salvation. Jesus is coming back and he has trusted us. He's trusted me. He's trusted you as the body of Christ. So it's up to us to share the gospel with our friends, our coworkers, everyone that we meet on the street. What is the heartbeat of God? The heartbeat is beating for people. It's beating for souls. And I think to myself, I think about, um, you know, sometimes we can be so scared and so fearful to reach out to somebody because we think, well, what if we don't know what to say? Or we're scared of their religion. We're scared of, well, what am I going to say because they've, they've grown up believing something completely different than me or they don't speak my language or they don't have my culture or they they don't have my family life what what is that common ground the common ground is that God 
bled and died for us. He manifested himself and, and died for us on Calvary. That is the common ground that all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. That our common ground is that we are all sinners. That we all need God. That we all need to be born again. That when you don't know what to say to someone, it's okay. Pray. Because our, our spirit precedes us. Tonight before I got up here, I said, God, purify my heart. Purify my mind. I don't want to get up there with anything that could hinder me because everything I am walks up to this pulpit. Everything, everything you are walks to your workplace. Everything you are walks to your school. Every, everything you are walks with you to that grocery store. And that's why I can walk in someplace and they can say, whoa, you're a bit different. I've been asked several times in my life, like, what church do you go to? And it's not because I was witnessing to them. It's just they felt something different. They felt that witness of the spirit. And, and it gives you an open door to be able to say, hey, let me tell you a story. This is not happening just by accident. And maybe uh, I was thinking about language barriers. And I, I read an article in Pentecostal Herald. It's an, a from when they first started uh, publishing it. But it was of this missionary couple, and they went to go witness to the Navajo Indians, but they did not know their language. But they would speak in tongues, and as they would speak in tongues, God allowed that diverse spirit, you know, to, to speak through them, and they would preach to them the plan of salvation through their language, but they were speaking in the Holy Ghost. And so sometimes all that we have to do is just pray. I read a story about Brother Bishop Urshan. He's passed on now, but he went to Russia to do a conference, and he was preaching, and it was a communist country. They weren't allowed to preach uh, Christianity and the gospel message that we have the freedom to preach tonight. But a bunch of Roman or Russian soldiers came into that building, and they lined them up against the wall to execute them. And Brother Urshan said, well, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go praising God. So he raised his hands, and he began to speak in tongues, and he just entered into a heavenly place. And when he opened his eyes, there were no Russian soldiers left. And the, the missionary said, I didn't know you knew Russian. And he said, I don't. He said, well, you were speaking fluent Russian. And what you said was there is an army that you know not of, and they are on their way, and they will defeat you. And it put fear in their hearts, and they fled from our church. That's the power that we have tonight, that there are no barriers when we serve God. There isn't a language barrier. There isn't a culture barrier. There isn't a religious barrier. That when we give our heart to God, that... That anything can happen. Uh, another um, story just popping in my head. A little boy at a, uh, a junior camp. He was eight years old. He received the gift of the Holy Ghost at youth camp. and Or junior camp. And he was just worshiping at the altar. And his parents were praying with him. And missionaries uh, to a Spanish-speaking country came up to his parents and said, Your son speaks beautiful Spanish. And they said, no, he doesn't speak Spanish. His, the only language he knows is English. And they said, well, he is saying, I am being filled with a river of life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's the power of our God. That is the power of our God. He's the one who has put language in this world. He's the one who knows it all. He can use it however he wants to, but he is just looking. He's looking everywhere for a willing vessel. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it says, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go take thee a wife of Hortums and children of Hortums. It feels weird to say that word. Uh, for the land hath committed great whoredom, <laughs> departing from the Lord. <laughs> so he went into Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, which conceived and bare him a son. So we read in this heart-wrenching story, a prophet, which is a very unique story because God said, like, 
dude, go marry a harlot. So this isn't a portion of scripture that I would use for young people on how to find a spouse. Uh, I would, it's, it's a very important uh, book because it was a mirror of Israel's relationship with God. That Israel was so far away from God that they were committing adultery with their Savior. And so the book of Hosea describes a heart-rending love story of a unilateral, unilateral love affair. Hosea is, is, is instructed by God to marry this woman of the night. And he obeys God and marries her. And in the process, I'm sure he falls in love with her. He, he bears children, sons, and daughters. Yet suddenly, her children are growing up, but a yearning for a strange old life starts to set in. And after meditating on her distant past, she began to crave that attention from the world again. And she left her husband. She abandoned her children. And maybe she lived in a fantasy world for a little bit. Maybe she went to parties, saw old friends, had laughter, but the fun was only a facade and life begins to deteriorate at a rapid pace. So imagine being Hosea, Marrying this woman who God told you to, this woman that you would have never chosen to marry and to love, yet God said, this is for my people. I want to use your life as an example to show Israel what kind of situation they are living in. And then Hosea, he obeys God, and then the love of his life leaves him. And goes back to her old lifestyle, which it's not like she was a waitress or anything. She went back to a terrible lifestyle. And he knew what she went back to. And God, he spoke to, to Hosea again in chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. It says, the Lord said to me, go, go show love to your wife again. Though she is loved, and this is NIV, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I brought her 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a half of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or intimate with any other man, and I will behave the same way toward you. Hosea must have been brokenhearted and his children abandoned, and he finds out about Gomer's predicament. And is told by God, go back to her. Go back to her. Go love her. And he took everything that he had. He took 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. And he sees what used to be a beautiful gomer reduced to a broken, unwanted, unattractive woman on a slavery block. Being auctioned off for much lower, I'm sure, than what he paid. She cannot look into his eyes. Jose is undaunted by her appearance, unfazed by her avoiding look, and he asks what the paying price is, and he pays it. And he says, Gomer, come home with me. I will restore you to your rightful place. Jose is able to do this because he had a heavenly heartbeat. God puts this example in the Bible to help us understand the agape love, which with he loves the loss, which he loves you and me. All of us have been a gomer a time or two. All of us have left that perfect love of the arms of our Savior and said, what is the point? All of us have done what we've wanted in our own eyes, yet sometimes we do not give other people that kind of respect that God has shown toward us. That when we look at people, when we see the hurt and the pain, the lifestyle, we have to pray, God, please give me a burden for this person. Because when we have a heavenly heartbeat, it does not matter. We will see past their bad attitude. We will see past how they are dressed. We will see past the language that they speak. We will see past their lifestyle. We will see past it all to that beating heart inside of them. That we know if we do not reach them that they will go to a devil's hell. That if we don't tell them about the love of God, that who else will tell them that I do not want their blood on my hands? And I don't want to think about how many people in my life that I've been too busy yeah. and I have walked by and my blood is dripping from my hands. 
I worked as a shoe store uh, in Niagara Falls. The story just, uh, just thought of it, but I loved working there. Loved it, and I was really good. I mean, I would sell some women 20 pairs of shoes just in one, one visit, and I would say, the shoes might here break the outfit. That was my line. And I don't know, like, women just believed me. And I, I just stole so many shoes, and I had a lot of shoes. When I went to Bible college, I had well over 100 pairs. I don't have that many anymore. Um, God delivered me. But, but I loved working there. Uh, uh, there was a huge staircase to the second floor because one floor of shoes is just not enough. And this little boy and his mom came, and he fell down the stairs. And, and there was blood, like, everywhere. And just maternal instinct, I guess, kicked in. And I, like, picked him up, and, and I was trying to, like, just care for him. And I looked down, and his blood was on my hands, and God spoke he said, you don't want people's souls, the blood of people's souls on your hands. And I just, I went to the restroom and I just prayed and I cried. I said, God, give me a love for your people. Give me a love for your people. Whenever I, I was shopping on Black Friday, you guys are going to think I'm a shopaholic, but I'm not. But I was shopping on Black Friday a few years ago in Chicago and I was in this very tall building and I just saw thousands of people on the road, and I just started to weep because I thought, who is going to reach them all? Who is going to tell them about the love of God? Who is going to say, you know what, you don't have to live broken forever. You don't have to live bruised forever. You don't have to live addicted forever. Understanding the value of a soul. Jesus taught that the value of a soul was more precious than the whole world. To God, a soul is the most important thing on earth. Upon beginning his ministry, Jesus immediately began to seek out and to call men to follow him. And during the final hours while suffering excruciating pain, he ministered to a lost thief and gave him the promise of eternity. Philip, he was directed by an angel to leave a great lead a great revival in Samaria to travel to the south to Gaza to preach just to one man, the man whom Philip was directed thirsted for living water but was plagued by confusion as he read Isaiah chapter 53. Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 15 verse 7 that there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. It was not a fortune that was lost, it was one coin. It was not a flock of sheep that was lost, it was a lamb. It was not a city that was lost, it was a son. It was that one person that you can reach. Even before this year is over, we still have a few days to reach people every single day of our life. That when our alarm go, goes off in the morning, that we say, souls, I need to reach someone today. I need to, I need to reach someone today. I need to tell somebody about the love of God today. Jesus ministered to the lost one by one. Zacchaeus, Nicodemus, the woman of the, at the well of Samaria, the woman caught in the act of adultery. He gave them all personal attention. That it will take time, it will take money, it will be exhausting sometimes to witness to people. It will get in, in the middle of your busy lifestyle. But there are more important things than sometimes going to bed on time. Sometimes God will call you to intercessory prayer. Sometimes God will call you to buy someone lunch. Sometimes God will call you to take time out just to speak to somebody. When I slow down and when I am very purposeful about reaching out, I, I think, oh, my goodness, there's people everywhere. Like, God, you really opened the doors today for me to minister. But it's not that. It's that I have allowed myself to take the time to open up those opportunities that God puts in my life every single day. It's ev all the time, all around us. Like, my pastor in Michigan, he was at the gas station pumping gas. And a man was saying, oh, I hate the gas prices. And Pastor Chapman was like, yeah, but God will provide. And the man said, oh, do you serve God? And he said, yeah, I'm a pastor down the road. 
and started talking to him, brought him to church. I was there in the middle of the day, and we prayed him through the Holy Ghost in the middle of the day. Just, I mean, it happened at the gas station, so it can literally happen anywhere. You might think, well, I don't have a lot of opportunity, but we do. We do. I, when I was at Bible college in Minnesota, my friend Holly and I, we were driving past a, a hospital. We were on our way probably to go to coffee or something, but God spoke to both of us to stop, and we, like, just in dead in our tracks, we stopped our little red tracker, and we prayed, like, God, lead us to the person that you want us to minister to, and as soon as we drove up to the emergency uh, runway, I saw this girl, and God spoke to me, that's the one, and I walked up to her. God gave me a scripture. I said it to her, and I said, I don't understand. We were driving by, but God spoke to us to stop and to minister to you. And we, we said everything that God placed on our heart, and, and she just began to weep. And she said, I just gave birth to a stillborn baby. And we held her, this stranger, in our arms for I don't even know how long, for at least an hour, and just let her weep in our arms because we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And I don't know her name. I don't know where she is right now. But it was a planted seed. We may not see the full result of every seed that we plant. We may never know whatever happens to a soul after we've planted a little seed. But I know the law of the harvest. God will say, I will bring a harvest. And he's the one that gives the increase. So I need to do my part and just sow as many seeds as I possibly can, as many places as I can, to try to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. James chapter 2, verse 2 through 5, some of my favorite scriptures. It says, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, you stand there or sit by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? I was once that poor woman who came in so broken. I may have looked good on the outside, but I was so broken on the inside. And that we need to just look at people. We need to pray, God, sh give me your eyes. Show me, Lord, pass their smile. Show me past their outward appearance, no matter what they are wearing, if they are dressed well, if they are dressed poorly, let me love them. Yes. These scriptures teach us that a poor man in vile raiment is just as valuable to God as a man with a gold ring in godly apparel, goodly apparel. All souls are important to him. And I've told this story before when I was a youth pastor in Michigan. One of my uh, young people, she brought a few of her friends to church, and one of the friends just looked like she hated the world and like she was about to murder me. And I thought, oh, my goodness, like, why, did, why is she even here? She's miserable. And I'm leading worship just like Sister Crystal is tonight, and I'm raising my hands, and God's like, go pray with her. And I'm like, no, go pray with her. And I'm a youth pastor. I should be super spiritual. And I just kept on ignoring the voice of God because I was like, God, don't you see her? She does not want to, she does not want me praying for her. Like if I lay my hand on her, she's going to punch me right in the face. Uh, and God was like knocking at my heart, go pray for her. And I said, okay, but if she punches me, it's your fault. <laughs> and I go and I, I just, I said, I feel like God wants me to pray for you. And as soon as my hand touched her forehead, she began to weep. That hard exterior, it was just for show. Inside, she was broken. Inside, she said, I just need love. I just need to feel what God's presence is. And it showed me, like, just obey God. It doesn't matter what people look like on the outside. It doesn't matter if they look like they hate the world. Love them anyway. It doesn't matter if they look like they don't need anything. They may be very wealthy. They may be a celebrity. They may be someone that you might think, oh, well, 
they don't want to hear what I have to say. But they do. They need to hear what we have to say. God does not care who they are, what they look like, where they may come from, what their social status might be, their level of intellect, their skin color, the language they speak. To him, they are a priceless treasure. The gomers of this world are people for whom Jesus went to Calvary. Jesus purchased their freedom, and it's up to us to tell them. As these biblical examples demonstrate, it will cost us something to be a soul winner. Normal living things reproduce themselves. Plants, animals, fowl, sea creatures, human beings. We are all created with the ability to reproduce themselves. And when God said, be fruitful and multiply, it's not just go make lookalikes, but it is him saying, go create people that are in my image. That I, I don't have any children of my own, but I have spiritual babes in Christ. That, that some of my young people that have gone to Bible college, they, they speak like me. They pray like me. They say things that I say. Why? Because I discipled them for years. That I reproduced myself, and I discipled them, and I invested in them. And I said, oh, God, I need to reach these young people so that they can grow, so that they can take the torch one day, so they can lead, so they can guide churches, so that they can be pastors one day. We have a responsibility, God says, to reproduce ourselves. God told Hosea, go love a woman who's an adulteress, who loves other gods. God loves the undesirable of society. It's important to see people through the eyes of God. You might say, I'm too busy or I'm too broken. I'm too hurt. I'm too this or that. You may know this song, Horatio G. Spafford. He lost his business in the Chicago fire in 1871. And he sent his family to Europe while he was rebuilding. The ship that sailed hit another ship and sank. They collided and his children drowned in the cold Atlantic Ocean. Upon arriving in Europe, his wife sent a simple telegram saying, saved alone. He took the next available ship to Europe and when he arrived at the place of the tragedy, he went out on the deck and sat down and began to write these words later set to music. When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrow like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When I read these words and I think of his life and his predicament, he did not allow anything to become an excuse. Circumstances in our life cannot alter a true devotion to Jesus. Devotion of this kind will cause us to love the lost. Devotion of this kind will allow us to say, you know what? I am going to intercede for these people. I don't care what it is that God is asking me to do. I am going to do it because I want to please God. Because I don't want to go to heaven alone. Because I want to see people get saved. There is no greater joy than when you invite someone to church, when you disciple them, when you teach them Bible studies, and you pray them through the Holy Ghost, and they get baptized in Jesus' name, and you literally see their whole life changed around. There is nothing greater. That's where I get my greatest joy, is when I see somebody receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, someone that I've invested in. And like I said before, not every seed we plant will show us the result, but that doesn't mean that it's not growing. And you might be scared to step out. You might be scared. You know, it, it happens to even me now. Like God will say, go talk to that person at Walmart or go talk to that person at Target. And I work at the church, so I used to witness to a lot of my coworkers, but I can't really save pastor. Uh, so I have to be really creative in the ways that I evangelize now. So whenever I go to Target, I have, like, certain people that I've seen several times over and over again, and I'm able to talk with them, but it's an open door for more conversations. Every time I go to the bank, I have certain tellers that I'm getting really close with. Some of them, you know, like, we're planning on going out for coffee, so that's an open door. So wherever you go, there's open doors for God to use you. Jesus tells us, Again, in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, that there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And think, weren't we all Samaritans? 
Weren't we all gomers? Weren't we all at one point that thief on the cross? Think to yourself, how has God loved you? And what has he loved you through? The heartbeat of God, it beats to the sound of the names of billions of people in this world. It beats. It's beating right now. It's saying, Nadia, Abigail, Michael, won't you hear me? Won't you see me? Won't you come close to me? We need a heavenly heart beating in our chest. We need a God to give us that passion. We need to pray, God, give me a desire to win the loss. Give me a desire to teach Bible studies. Give me a desire, Lord, to pray people through the Holy Ghost. Give me a desire, Lord, to show people your great love. Give me a desire to not be judgmental, Lord, but to show them the love of God no matter what, no matter who, no matter when. Hallelujah. There are approximately 2 million people living in the Washington, Baltimore area. That's two million reasons to get on our face and cry out to those who are lost. That's two million reasons to push beyond fear and insecurities to share our testimonies with people, regardless of who they are. That gives us two million reasons to study the word of God fervently and to position our lives to have a consistent prayer life. Prayerlessness will sabotage your future in every way. My prayer is lead me to every honest, hungry soul, God. I believe that we are on the cusp of a third great awakening. God is wanting to just spread this gospel across the world and fill thousands, millions, billions of people with his spirit. When you feel impressed to go pray for someone, invite them to church, do it. Don't listen to that voice of doubt that says they don't want to hear what you have to say or, you, or every, maybe they don't need God. There is power in our spoken word. We need to intercede for the lost and stand in the gap. Intercessory prayer is the deepest and most unselfish form of prayer. This type of prayer is characterized by terms such as wrestling in prayer, groanings that cannot be uttered, and fervent, agonizing prayer. The word intercession, intercession means to come between. It's standing in the gap. Moses prayed in intercession for Israel, and they were spared. Abraham prayed in intercession for Sodom and Gomorrah. Paul prayed in intercession for Israel. Paul agonized and interceded for the Galatian church. And at times, the Spirit will lead us where we say, God, help them. And where we will enter in, where we are just speaking in tongues, and we are literally taken someplace. Maybe I'm speaking in tongues, but I am, I am praying for someone in a different country. I am praying for someone who's about to commit suicide. I'm praying for someone to say, you know what, follow God, don't go there. And, and we don't know what we are praying, but that's the beauty of it. That's what we are here for. It's an unselfish form of prayer. It's time to intercede for Beltsville. It's time to intercede for Laurel. It's time to intercede for Baltimore. It's time to intercede for your city, for your workplace, for your family, for the people that you come in contact with. Every single day, it's time to intercede and say, God, please give me a heavenly heartbeat. Put that beating in my chest, oh God, where I don't even have to think about it anymore, where it becomes second nature to me, God, where I don't even have to, I just do it. I just share your word. I just pray with people. I just show them love. Can you hear the broken hearts of the people in your city? Can you hear their cry? Can you hear the cry of your family members saying, can you help me? They might not say it, but they are feeling it in their spirit because they are not happy. And they are searching for something that we have. Let's all stand. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 9, it says, 
Would I ever bring this nation to the point of birth and then not deliver it, asks the Lord. No, I would never keep this nation from being born, says your God. And my prayer tonight is, Lord, give us the strength to deliver babes at Cross Creek. Give us wisdom to teach them so they can grow. Lord, let us hear the cries of the lost people of this city. Let us feel the sadness of people that we talk to. Let us stand in the gap with intercessory prayer. Lord, let us stand in the gap, Lord, of those who are just sending themselves to hell, Lord, by the situations and circumstances that they are involved in. Let us feel the desperation of our city, our family, our friends, our coworkers. Let us hear their cry when we go to work. Let us hear their cry when we go grocery shopping. Let us hear their cry when we drive past them. God, I pray that you would unveil our eyes, that we could see souls everywhere. Just not a person, but a soul. Convict us of complacency. That we would look past ourselves to the point of the need, oh God that your heart is beating right now for the souls in this city. Your heart is beating for our unsafe family members. Your heart is beating for our unsafe children. Your heart is beating for the homeless man and woman on the street. Your homeless, Lord Jesus, your heart is beating for the gomers, oh God, on the streets, oh Lord, looking. Lord, let us feel your heart tonight. I don't want to be satisfied with a mediocre life. I don't want to be satisfied by just being happy and content in my home. I don't want to be satisfied, oh God, but I want you to move. I encourage you to come to this altar and pray. Lord, let me feel your heartbeat. Let me love what you love. Let me hate what you hate. Teach me how to love your people. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, give me wisdom. Help me impact this world with the gospel. Help me hear the cry of my city. Help me hear the cry of lost souls. Help me hear the cry of people who are saying, help me. I don't know what to do. Is there an answer? Is there a savior? Is there a person that will share their life, their love? their resources, their words of wisdom with me. with God, that family I'll member, that co-worker, that person that you have been trying to reach. It is not the end. It is not too late. They still have a heart beating in their chest. They still have breath in their lungs. Speak in faith and the word will go forth like lightning. It will go to that person and that they will feel your presence, oh God, in the name of Jesus.
you to think of at least one person right now. That one person that you say, God, I've been praying for this person for a very long time. But speak faith right now. We're going to go into a time of prayer just for a few more moments in his presence. But have faith. God, you hear my prayer. It is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his word, it is his will, that it is his, his desire. So think of that one person right now and call their name out, cry their name out in prayer. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, my God. Intercede for them, stand in the gap for them. In closing tonight, let's just end in prayer and pray your own prayer for those people. Lord, thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray that my sister, oh God, Jonna, would come back to you. My Uncle David, my Aunt Gail, Lord, for those who have fallen away, for those who have felt your presence and have been like a gomer, oh God, and have searched for their own lifestyles only to find out there is nothing this world has to offer that is greater than your presence. Lord, move in our hearts. Let us feel that heart beating inside of our chest, oh God, for souls. Lord, that everything that we would do would be driven. Lord, there is nothing greater that we can do than to serve you and to bring people with us, oh God, to share your word and to enhance and expand your kingdom. Lord, the greatest commandment is to love you with all our hearts and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. Show us what it is to obey those commandments. Lord, you are mighty. You are great. You are worthy. And thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for 
filling us. Thank you for washing us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.